Over the last several years, the UK wrestling scene has had its share of ups and downs. Even with the peaks and valleys, they've produced some of the best wrestlers and best matches of the last decade across several different promotions. But for over 40 years, one company controlled the British wrestling scene. It outlasted the competition, outsmarted government committees, and inspired generations. The changing taste of the fans and an invasion of American sports entertainment caused it to all collapse. As suggested in the comments section, this is Defunct Championship Wrestling, Episode 9, Joint Promotions. Good afternoon, and welcome to another freestyle wrestling So right off the bat, because the story of joint promotions is so vast and involves so many partner promotions, we're going to focus on the largest and most successful of them, Dale Martin Promotions, to tell the tale. Dale Martin Promotions got started in post-war London in 1948. It was founded by Les Martin and the Dale brothers, Jack, Billy, and Johnny. It's important to note the struggles wrestling was facing at the time. For the first 30 years or so of the 20th century, wrestling grew in popularity and became one of the biggest sports in the country. But just prior to World War II, that popularity had taken a major downturn when the leading promotion at the time, the British Wrestling Alliance, had become much more violent and theatrical with its all-in wrestling style, putting into question its legitimacy. And that truly mirrors wrestling's fall from grace in the US as well with the release of the tell-all book, The Fall Guys. So after the war was over, a new set of rules and standards were put in place to oversee the King of Sports, known as the Admiral Lord Montavan's Rules, named after the man who headed the committee that designed them. They established seven weight classes in the now iconic rounds system. So this was the environment that Les and the Dale brothers started in. Les was an artist by trade, and according to a 1965 Sports Illustrated article, he yearned to go back to his painting. Jack Dale had been the British middleweight champion in 1935, and was known as the King of the Flying Tackle. They ran events throughout the end of the 40s and early 1950s, outlasting several competitors. They saw the success the NWA was having in the US, and decided to adopt the concept themselves in 1952. As a means of survival, Dale Martin and seven other promotions decided to form a loose partnership and created an agreement amongst themselves that separated the UK into territories that each promotion would lord over. They called it Joint Promotions. This alliance allowed the promoters to share talents and determine together who would hold the championships for the various weight classes, allowing all of them to make so much more money in the process. This especially became a helpful strategy when television came onto the scene. In 1955, Joint Promotions landed a TV slot on ATV, expanding their visibility even more. But not all were on board with this arrangement. Several wrestlers banded together to go on strike against Joint in the mid-1950s, accusing them of being a cartel. Together they formed the Wrestlers Welfare Society. They attempted to help wrestlers through hardships, but also to act as an independent employment agency for the wrestlers. Ultimately, the strike didn't last very long and joint promotions continued as they had since the beginning. The failed strike left the wrestlers with even less power over their futures than before. Joint success also saw the top American talent at the time, Lou Thez, come across the pond for stops with each partner promotion in 1957 and 1958. In the mid-60s, ATV merged with England's ABC network, forming ITV, and in 1964, launching World of Sport. Now, if you're an ignorant American like me, you assumed World of Sport was just the name of the wrestling show. But World of Sport was actually more of a compilation series. It was pretty similar to the US ABC series Wide World of Sports, covering various sports happenings around the kingdom. But it was Joint's wrestling segments that proved the most popular. It made stars of Jackie Palo, Mick McManus, Billy Robinson, and one of my favorites, the exotic Adrian Street. They also had several other TV series through the 1960s, like The Saturday Sports Time, Midweek Wrestling, and Let's Go. That was the name of the show. Let's Go. Let's go. These TV deals reportedly brought the partnership $15,000 a week, with only about $200 going to the wrestlers, allegedly. 
By this point, Dale Martin on its own was running about 10 shows a night, 45 shows a week, and joint promotions as a whole was earning somewhere around $6 million a year. This monopoly, however, wouldn't go unchallenged. The first of these challengers came in the form of the British Wrestling Federation. It was founded in 1957 by several independent promoters and former joint wrestler Paul Lincoln, also known as Dr. Death. Unable to get onto television, they aired their matches in movie theaters. The strategy paid off for a while, and for a time, they took the country by storm. They nipped at Joint's heels for nearly a decade before infighting among the promoters allowed them to be absorbed by Joint promotions in the late 1960s. Joint continued to dominate the scene throughout the 1970s, welcoming newer stars like Mark Rocco, the incredible Johnny Saint, and obviously Giant Haystacks and Big Daddy. It's hard to describe Big Daddy's popularity in the 1970s and 80s. The best comparison to make is Hulk Hogan in the 1980s WWF. He was beloved. He had the cartoon and everything. And if you asked a granny or great granny in the UK today about wrestling, she'd probably talk about Big Daddy. Although the man behind the character, Shirley Crabtree Jr., had wrestled for decades, he truly found his greatest success as the Jolly Babyface. He was the star the company would be built around going forward. The 1970s also saw joint promotions ownership change almost constantly. First in the early 70s to the Hearst Park Syndicate, a company that owned horse tracks. They bought out joint but left the partners in charge of their respective businesses. Just a few years later as the partners looked towards retiring, Dale Martin Promotions was bought out by Jarvis Astaire. Astaire had made his money by promoting boxing on early closed circuit broadcasts. He would later play a key role in bringing SummerSlam 92 to Wembley Stadium. Astaire replaced Johnny Dale as head of the company with his brother, Billy Dale. Astaire also purchased stakes in other partner promotions, giving him controlling ownership of joint promotions. Later on, joint was purchased by British gambling company William Hill. An odd choice for the purchase, to be honest. The late 70s and early 80s saw the rise of a new generation of competitors make their way up the ranks. Marty Jones, Chris Adams, Dave Finley, Dynamite Kid, and Davey Boy Smith all made their names during this period. However, things would start to take a turn in the 1980s. Wrestling's popularity in the UK again started to wane. All these new talents I've mentioned, none were being pushed as hard as Haystacks or Big Daddy. Joint promotions had put all their eggs into the old guard's basket even as the new stars became more popular with the fans. By this point, the younger stars were working six-man tags with Big Daddy, doing all the work with Daddy only tagging in for the finish. It was a formula that became tiresome. Fans also started to grow bored with the more straight-laced style of Joint's presentation. Now sure, they had their rule breakers, but nothing to the level of the heels in the United States, except for Kendo Nagasaki. There would also be new competition coming from one Brian Dixon. Dixon was the promoter for Wrestling Enterprises, a small promotion that was surviving off of the crumbs of Joint's success. But with Joint's business on the downturn and some wrestlers being disgruntled, he saw an opportunity to pounce. Back in 1979, to liven things up a bit, Joint Promotions introduced a world championship title, won by Wayne Bridges. The next year, John Quinn became the champion. The story of Bridges chasing Quinn was expected to reset the promotion. But in 1981, in the middle of his reign, John Quinn jumped ship to Wrestling Enterprises. So Joint declared the title vacant and awarded it back to Wayne Bridges. Wrestling Enterprises was growing a major following with its faster pace, its more exciting technical style, and its storyline-driven shows that carried over from week to week. Others soon followed to Wrestling Enterprises like Johnny Saint, Mark Rocco, and even Wayne Bridges in 1983. In 1984, Dixon rebranded as All-Star Wrestling and started giving opportunity to stars like Robbie Brookside and Tom Thumb. Did they start competing at completely different times? Yes. Do I care? No. I just wanted to mention Tom Thumb because he's fantastic. Two men enjoying this one. <laughs> and what's, the, what's the feat as Brakes lifts it? Just behind Brake's knee to prevent the continuation of the left. And the body scissors to the next. 
Grace looks down at me as if to say, what the heck do I do with this phone? <laughs> Joint promotions carried on as best they could. Though All-Star had taken many of their talents, they were still the top promotion in the country with a strong television presence. But that would soon change as well. In 1986, Big Daddy's brother Max Crabtree purchased Joint from the William Hill Agency. Max had previously been the booker for the promotion, raising a lot of questions about why the company was built around Big Daddy for so long. Maybe reasons other than his amazing popularity. That same year, World of Sport was cancelled. ITV would give wrestling, specifically joint promotions, its own show. The show still delivered the same action and stars fans had loved, but the time slot was far from consistent. If fans don't know when your show is on, they're not going to watch it. And to make matters even worse, they lost their exclusivity status with ITV. The network added All-Star Wrestling and WWF programming to its ITV Wrestling show. Joint and All-Star rotated airings every week, with WWF airing as specials. And as many have said about this period, once fans got a taste of Hulk Hogan, Macho Man Randy Savage, and others in the WWF, it was only a matter of time until the inevitable. 1987 would see a major and controversial blow to Joint's image in that of their biggest star. In August, Big Daddy wrestled King Kong Kirk, a Joint mainstay. After a splash and a pinfall, Kirk laid motionless in the ring. He was brought to the hospital and pronounced dead of a heart attack. In the aftermath, it was revealed by Kirk's widow that Max Crabtree had only been paying 25 bucks for main event matches, and 30 bucks for main events against Big Daddy. An autopsy found no wrongdoing by the Crabtrees, but the damage was already done to their reputation at that point. By December of 1988, ITV had a new head of sports programming, Greg Dyke. And as we've seen time and again, a new head of programming is always bad for wrestling. In an effort to move away from their working class image, ITV pulled the wrestling show from the schedule. And if Joint's reported asking price of over 17000 is accurate, they weren't going to find a home anywhere else. Not with the WWF supposedly only asking for 700 to air their show. Not even stars like a young William Regal or English Greg Valentine could save the show. So Crabtree and Joint went back to basics, touring as hard as they possibly could, trying to attract whatever Big Daddy fans were left. As Max Crabtree would later say, there wasn't a hall in the country we didn't put wrestling in. And when that novelty wore off, they stopped. Max Crabtree ceased operating as joint promotions and in 1992 relaunched as Ring Wrestling Stars. They restarted with a smaller budget and new roster, aside from Big Daddy of course. They chugged along for a couple of years but were never able to recapture the magic of the glory days. And with All-Star Wrestling bringing Davy Boy Smith back to the UK for a couple of tours, there was no way Crabtree could compete. RWS would shut down at the end of August 1994, bringing an end to a chapter of wrestling history after 42 years. The end of the joint promotion story. Its legacy, however, would carry on in the modern talents inspired by its stars. Wrestlers like Cole Cabana, Zack Sabre Jr., Chris Hero, Nigel McGuinness and others utilized moves and spots taken directly from the British style of wrestling popularized by World of Sport. All-Star Wrestling would survive all the lows wrestling has faced in the UK and remains in business today. ITV rebooted World of Sport Wrestling with a special pilot in 2016 with Jim Ross on commentary. They then produced a 10-part series that was ultimately dropped in 2019 when ITV got the rights to air AEW. Without joint promotions, the style of wrestling today may be completely different. If you've never watched World of Sport matches before, there's some on YouTube, and I highly encourage you to check it out. It can be a bit slow at times, but the techniques and chain wrestling used is absolutely fascinating and so much fun to watch, especially if you're a fan of Pete Dunne or Zack Sabre Jr. matches. Like always, let me know your thoughts and memories of joint promotions in the comments. And don't forget to suggest a defunct promotion for a future video. I'm Scott from WrestleSpective, thanks for watching.